Um, hi, everyone. Before we get started, uh, just a couple of announcements um, regarding some logistics. So the homework is going to get posted um, at the end of this lecture. It's actually already in the files. If you want to take a look at it, you can. Um, let's see what else. Uh, in terms of office hours, I have uh, posted mine uh, on Canvas uh, with a Zoom link. And that'll be for an hour on Mondays, uh, Monday morning from 10 to 11. Um, Facundo is gonna have his uh, on Thursday uh, for two hours in the evening, but we're still working out um, some Zoom logistic things. He doesn't have a admin account yet, and so we're trying to get that set up. So as soon as that's done, we'll post the link um, and, and hopefully we'll be able to get that set up. Um, readings have been posted for this lecture and for lecture three. Uh, like I said, the, the readings are optional, but if you're interested, um, some of them are, are pretty interesting, so, so have a look. Um, and lastly, for the course project, um, all the deadlines are getting pushed back one week. Uh, we're still having to come up with um, one or two more mentors and, and project descriptions. Um, and so once that's, as soon as that's ready, I'll post it on Canvas um, and we'll hold off on doing the mentor meetings um, by, by one week. So it won't be next week, but the, the week after. Um, I did get some questions about how that's happening. Um, and so it, it's not actually gonna be during the lecture time. Uh, the groups are going to reach out to uh, the mentors individually and, and uh, meet with them online. Um, so you'll be able to do that on your own time. It doesn't have to be um, during, during the same time as, as lecture. Uh, okay. So uh, moving on to the topic of today, um, we're gonna be introducing uh, life cycle analysis, uh, also known as LCA, of energy systems. Um, so we'll, we'll first be talking about uh, what it is, why it's important, uh, then we'll look at uh, how you actually do it, and then um, provide some practical examples of uh, LCA implementation. Um, this is a pretty high level introduction to LCA. There are actually entire classes that you could take just dedicated to, to life cycle analysis. Um, but hopefully this will introduce this uh, as, as a concept for people um, and <coughs> potentially generate interest uh, in, in this topic as well. This is probably something uh, that can be applied to any of the, the course projects or, or the majority of course projects. Um, the relevance of uh, this, this type of analysis um, spans both sort of uh, traditional engineering applications, applications all the way to um, practical policies. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's a fairly important concept um, to keep in mind as, as you think about uh, working in energy systems, engineering systems. Okay, so what is life cycle assessment? Um, also known as uh, life cycle analysis, um, cradle to grave analysis, uh, well to wheels. Um, it is a technique to assess the environmental impacts associated with uh, all the stages of a product's life. Um, and, and so this uh, includes things that we typically think of and a lot of things that we, we don't typically uh, keep track of. Uh, so all the way from the raw material extraction, so uh, when we're thinking specifically about energy, um, you know, the, we're, we're, we have been usually talking about the production of energy through like combustion of fossil fuels, for example. Um, but you also have impacts from, you know, extracting that fossil fuel through mining, uh, the refining of the fuel, maybe um, turning crude oil into gasoline, for example, all of that processing, 
uh, the transportation and distribution of, of the fuel uh, and of the secondary energy. So for example, electricity going through um, transmission and distribution lines, uh, and then how we actually use it. So all the way from uh, beginning to end, uh, that is considering the full sort of life cycle of an energy um, product. One of the other things uh, about uh, LCA is that there can be many different sort of environmental effects. We've mainly been talking about greenhouse gas emissions. We've touched a little bit about uh, on um, air pollution, um, but there are a whole sort of gamut of different environmental impacts um, that can that can happen. Um, and, and so, in in providing both the full uh, analysis of the life cycle as well as all the different uh, sorts of impact, you can provide a much better foundation for uh, policy making and, and you can avoid some adverse effects. For example, you know, if you change from like one material to another, you know, the use phase of that cycle could make it seem like it's a much better sort of environmental decision and you might get some public policy to support that. But if you look at maybe the material extraction and the mining, it could be more damaging to the environment. And if you don't consider you know, all of these uh, parts of the LCA, uh, then you could be missing a lot of really important impacts. Um, the term actually comes from uh, this idea uh, that you need to include all of these, um, all of these different stages of, of the life cycle. Uh, and it's been uh, pretty well formula, uh, formalized. Uh, there's an international standard for uh, basically how to do these. Um, it's the ISO, I believe it's 14, 14040 uh, standards for, for LCA. Um, and and we're, we're gonna step through the um, basic process of, of how to go through um, go through and conduct an, an LCA. Um, LCA extends beyond just sort of energy uh, use. Um, there, there are lots of applications of LCA and the ones that we're gonna be focusing on specifically are looking at uh, impacts on emissions, land, water, and resource use um, from energy systems. Uh, this is, mainly going to be for uh, two particular, or we're going to highlight two particular topics, um, one from power plants uh, and one from alternative fuel vehicles. Um, <clears throat> and, and often people call that well to wheels analysis because you're getting it from uh, all the way from the oil well uh, to, you know, spinning the wheels uh, of the vehicle. And, and actually even beyond that at the, at the end of life is, is also oftentimes considered. Um, the sorts of impacts uh, will include resource consumption, air and water quality um, from the manufacturing end. Uh, there are impacts of, um, there are other sorts of applications are impacts on, on food choices. Um, and, and this actually is related even to what we're doing with, with biofuels. I'll give an example at the end of class. Uh, of that in, in a practical application in actually public policy, um, the sort of decision between uh, providing energy and, pr and providing food, which is a real trade-off. Um, and then there are a whole sort of other slew of um, LCA applications uh, that again, aren't necessarily even tied with, with energy. Um, for example, I think when I first learned about LCA um, in, in grad school, it was uh, actually the, the, the example that, that they provided, one of the more famous ones, um, was about water resource use um, from genes. Um, so Levi, Levi Jeans actually did this analysis where um, they wanted to look at the water consumption associated with the uh, production of, of the genes. Uh, and they wanted to find out where sort of the, the best place to reduce 
water consumption was along the whole sort of life cycle of uh, a pair of jeans. Um, and so they looked at everything from, you know, um, growing uh, the plant-based material and the water use associated with that, uh, all the way to the manufacture of, uh, manufacturing of the jeans, um, and then the actual transportation and distribution of that material to the end consumer, um, and then the, the actual use of the genes. And, and what they found was uh, m maybe a little bit surprising, the place where the, the most resources were being used uh, in terms of water consumption is actually the washing of the genes um, when, you, when you do laundry. Uh, and, and that sort of swamped everything else. Um, and so in, in that particular example, you know, they, they tried to do some stuff where they made it so that you, you, you would need to wash the jeans sort of less often. Um, and so LCA can, can reveal a lot of sort of counterintuitive results um, when it comes to thinking about impacts and, and where the impacts are, are most important. Uh, and, and that's why it's important to do this sort of analysis um, because you may be sort of surprised to find the places where you can make uh, the, the biggest change. Um, so an LCA can really help to um, help decision makers to uh, select the product or the process that can reduce the impacts on the environment uh, to the greatest extent. Um, and, and so like I was saying with this uh, particular example with the Levi jeans, um, you can use this information to modify the product or the process in such a way to, to sort of most efficiently reduce uh, impacts. Um, by identifying uh, transfer of environmental impacts um, from one portion of your LCA process to, to another, uh, you can sort of better get a handle of, uh, uh, of the best places to make a change. Uh, and if you don't do them, right, these, these transfer processes might not be uh, recognized. Um, so it'll be important to, to consider this sort of analysis um, as, as you think holistically about uh, doing any sort of energy and, and engineering based analysis. Uh, okay, so enough about why it's important. Uh, let's think now about how you would go about conducting uh, an LCA. Um, so there are sort of basic steps uh, in, in an LCA, um, defining the goal and the scope. Uh, and, and this may seem sort of obvious, but actually this is one of the trickiest parts uh, of, of the LCA um, because scoping of the problem can be, uh, can be fairly arbitrary. Uh, and so you need to be able to make a, a, a sort of uh, defensible um, assumption about where you want to draw, draw your boundaries. Uh, and then you conduct the inventory analysis. This can be difficult because uh, data can be sort of hard to come by. Um, there are databases and software um, uh, that, that, that allow you to, to do this. Um, Okay, I see a question. Can I give an example of uh, doing the goal and scoping definition? Um, yeah, uh, I, I'm actually, I'll, I'll give an example actually on, on the next slide. Um, so, so inventory analysis um, for, for life cycle, uh, there are databases and, and software programs that people have developed, um, things like uh, EcoInvent, Simapro, uh, these would be things that you would get into more detail on if you were sort of taking a full on class uh, on LCA and it, and it gives, um, if I wanted to look at uh, impacts of um, using uh, a light duty vehicle, for example, um, it will tell you with the, in, in the inventory sort of 
everything from the manufacturing of the vehicle to things like extracting the steel, processing the steel, and all the emissions associated with that. If you're doing it in like the U.S. versus uh, versus in Europe, uh, depending on also where you're importing the steel from, all of these things are are the types of data that you would need to conduct the LCA and would be included. Um, as part of the inventory analysis. And, and the reason why I say that that's tricky is because sometimes you, you might not have the exact data and you have to make assumptions. So you, you may not know, for example, if I were talking about a car, exactly where the metal is coming from and, and that could make a pretty big difference. Um, so, so a lot of the, uh, uh, the bulk of the work, I would say, um, really from an analytical perspective and, and actually doing this in practice uh, will, will come in uh, in the inventory analysis. Um, the impact assessment is, is also pretty tricky um, uh, and, and important to, to think about. I think this ties directly into the goal because the, the impacts that you care about have to get selected um, at, at that point. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this. Uh, and of course, all of this is is subject to to interpretation and and different assumptions. Like I was mentioning, even for the inventory analysis, you're making some assumptions. For the impact analysis, you're choosing what impacts to measure. That's that's also uh, a, comes with a set of assumptions. Um, so it'll be important to interpret exactly what you're trying to do um, to your final audience. Okay, so. Um, for a product life cycle, um, we can think about uh, this diagram as sort of a rough sketch of a typical sort of uh, life cycle analysis um, for a particular product. Um, so what might this be? Um, well, actually, let's, let's, let's go back to our example of, of of the um, pair of genes. Um, so you have raw material acquisition here. Um, and so this might be um, growing of cotton, right? And, and so that in itself has a whole set of things associated with it. Uh, and then the production is, you know, in a uh, clothing factory, um, and that requires uh, electricity from your energy supply, um, and eventually this gets used by the consumer, and this could include impacts from washing, uh, washing the jeans, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and if we think really carefully uh, about uh, about this, you can you can quickly sort of get out of hand, right? So so this this particular chart might look a little bit different. So you may have some step here in between, which is transport, um, and and so that would be like going from the factory to a retail outlet, going to your home. Uh, okay, and so if you if you think about it, we could do something like this. Well, uh, for the transport, you need a truck, right? Um, so let's say truck, and, and you have some associated use of that. But then the truck itself um, has to be uh, produced um, produced uh, and manufactured, and then the materials from the truck coming from uh, like uh, raw materials such as, such as steel, um, and on and on, because then the steel would need um, some sort of uh, transport uh, to go from, uh, from the steel to, to that, which means you need more trucks to do that transportation uh, and you can get, you could do this forever, right? I could, I could just keep branching out because everything is sort of interrelated. Um, and so that's, that's part of the challenge in the goal and the scoping is to be able to here, uh, 
uh, choose this thing, which is called the system boundary. Um, yeah, okay, so I see question. So basically you have to choose where to start the LCA uh, based on the product. Yeah, and, and so, you know, this particular product or, or energy, um, you know, we, we can easily sort of define, uh, or, or we can quickly define all of these things that are related to that particular product or that particularly, uh, particular energy system. Um, but you have to learn where it makes the most sense to draw the system boundary. And, and, and maybe um, that, well, when I say makes, makes the most sense, it, it's sort of based on your um, assumptions that, that you're making. And so, you know, it, it may make sense to include one thing for one type of analysis and another thing for, for a different type of analysis. Um, but at the end of the day, there's always some kind of uh, judgment call in, in where you're making some sort of cutoff, right? Because uh, really the, the life cycle could go on, uh, or the inclusion of things in a life cycle analysis could go on infinitely. Um, and so obviously you, you can't do that. Um, one technique, actually we're, we're not gonna talk too much about this. There, there's more discussion about this. Um, in, in a sort of full-on class, but one way you can help to figure out um, uh, what to include in the system boundaries is you have sort of a larger system boundary than you think you need. Uh, you do the analysis and you find out that, you know, certain components that you've included in the life cycle analysis aren't really um, impactful or important to the LCA. So like if I included the upstream production of like a truck and I attributed uh, all of the the use of of the impact of of that particular uh, truck, and and what I mean by that is like, um, say say that the the truck does uh, the truck that does the transportation for jeans also transports uh, like a hundred other things. So if it's like a hundred units of impact um, for a truck, uh, then you only get one unit of impact uh, of the truck for the product you are interested in, uh, which means um, even though it has like some sort of impact associated with it, you only attribute a small portion of that impact to your particular product um, because it's doing all these other things and you wouldn't say uh, all of it is, is getting um, attributed to, you know, transported for genes because then you'd be double counting if you were looking at, at other things. Um, and so that's, that's one way to help draw the system boundary is to identify things that don't really make an impact and sort of cut those things out. Um, okay, so the steps in the, the, the basic steps um, uh, of the LCA, define and describe the product, process, or activity, um, create your system boundaries, uh, define a functional unit. Okay, so this is a pretty important concept in, in life cycle analysis. Uh, a functional unit is um, basically the a uniform uh, unit that you can use across your uh, analysis so that everything can be compared to in, in terms of apples to apples. Um, and so this um, this this might be uh, let's see a, a particular example of a functional unit um, would be something like uh, passenger passenger miles um, and so you for in, in transportation um, or, or ton miles I'm, I'm thinking of for, for freight in, in transportation uh, so that uh, for one particular unit I can do a measurable uh, activity in each process in the LCA um, and so 
uh, if I'm transporting um, some amount of, of good, um, if it's, let's see, if it's one, uh, one ton mile is my functional unit, uh, then when I think about, for example, the, uh, the, the genes example, um, the amount of water that you would need to use for uh, planting the like cotton trees, um, that all has to get related to uh, the quantity uh, and, and uh, amount associated to um, this particular unit. Um, and so everything would be measurable to, to your functional unit so that um, you're not working with sort of different quantities in different phases of, of the life cycle. Um, and then the level of accuracy required is uh, part of the, the scoping process in which you want to figure out um, how precise and, and accurate that you want to be. Uh, and so if you're cutting things out at like the, you know, 1% level for the system boundaries, um, then, then that gives you some information about how uh, sensitive your final answer would be, right? It would be like plus or minus uh, uh, 1%, right? Because you're, you're cutting, cutting certain things out. So the level of accuracy can, can help also inform how you decide to set up your system boundary. Um, Okay, so I see, uh, so there's still some confusion about the, the functional unit, so a, a different example. Um, yeah, so let's see. Um, if, I, if I were to d think about a functional unit for energy, um, maybe, uh, the, the final energy or the final final functional unit would be the delivered energy at your home. So that would be uh, like a kilowatt hour um, delivered. Um, and so if I think about if, if I think about um, the life cycle process, uh, I'll start at the end here. So this is my home and then uh, electricity, um, transmission is another step. Uh, and then I'll have, um, fuel combustion. So this would be what would be happening, uh, at the power plant. Um, and then you would have mining and extracting of your of your fuel um, and so if we're if we're mainly sort of considering the the kilowatt hours delivered as the final functional unit uh, of the LCA um, you know this would be kilowatt hours um, from the power plant this might be MMBTU uh, or gigajoules. Um, and then this could have um, other sorts of uh, uh, resource impacts. Um, so this may have some energy impacts. Uh, this may have environmental impacts. And the idea is that um, everything has to be sort of standardized to uh, your, your kilowatt hour delivered. Um, yeah, so, so energy impacts is just more uh, energy use. Um, so this, this may be uh, additional like kilowatt hours. Um, and so every unit, um, uh, of kilowatt hour delivered uh, has some sort of associated um, thing happening with it upstream. Okay, and so these all have to be made equivalent to uh, your, your kilowatt hour um, delivered. Um, and, and so if it's, to, to put it more concretely, 
if it's like uh, if it's one if it's one kilowatt uh, hour delivered, um, then I want to have uh, the per the per kilowatt hour delivered coming out of the um, electricity transmission coming out of the the fuel combustion. So you would maybe have you know if it's x x units of mm BTU per uh, kilowatt hour delivered um, and it's Y units of kilowatt hour out of the plant per kilowatt hour delivered. Um, I can't I can't add up these these things without translating it to a standard um, unit. Yeah, so exactly. So um, in, in the chat, there are some methods to essentially convert units to the final functional unit. That's, that's exactly right. So you want to convert everything into your functional unit so that everything can be compared apples to apples. Um, and so even though different, different things uh, different portions of your process uh, operate traditionally in a specific type of unit. Um, in, in order to do a proper comparison, you want to be able to convert everything into your, your functional unit. Okay. So uh, let's take a look at a um, more sort of concrete specific example. So this is the system boundary drawn around energy, the energy it takes to um, bake a loaf of bread. So five megajoules per loaf. And if I draw the boundary right, uh, right here uh, around the oven, um, then you would just say, okay, the energy impact of doing this is is five megajoules, um, but you want to expand and extend the boundary to include um, upstream energy consumption, uh, and so this would be uh, the electricity um, going through the transmission system. This would include uh, production of the electricity at the power plant, and then. Uh, I, I guess in this particular example, it's, it's coal, so it would be uh, the mining and then the transportation of the coal to the power plant, um, all of which has some associated impacts. Um, this is oftentimes uh, what we call the sort of use phase associated um, with the production of a particular good. Uh, so this is all the sort of like marginal production, right? Um, this, this sort of is affected by uh, uh, every time, every time you do it, um, you, you're increasing sort of the marginal use. Uh, you can also think about um, the sort of fixed, uh, fixed stuff. And, and so this is the production of uh, something like your the the vehicle or the production of the power plant. Uh, in, in this case, um, this is talking about the, the fixed uh, uh, impacts associated with the production of of the oven. So you have steel production and transport. Um, and as I mentioned before, uh, the system boundary can be continually expanded. Right, we can think about the construction of the plant that produces the, uh, the, the steel or things associated with the, the transportation. And so it's very important to define your, your system boundary here. Uh, and then the sort of next step in the LCA is thinking about uh, the inventory. What are the inputs and what are uh, the, the outputs? Um, and so, the inputs for a unit process and the unit that we are, we're concerned with here is one, uh, or in, in the previous example, is one loaf of bread. Uh, so what are the materials that you need to produce that bread, right? And so this is uh, 
from the raw materials of you know the grain and, and wheat production and, and farming process all of that uh, needs to go into there all the the transportation of, of those goods uh, from the farm to the store to your home all of that needs to happen uh, and then also we talked about the energy associated with baking the bread um, so providing electricity or providing natural gas you know, depending on, on what kind of oven you use uh, those are also inputs right so all of these all of these inputs are the things that that go that you need uh, to feed into your LCA you know for the per loaf of bread um, yeah and, and so just as, an, as another example right that particular example for the functional unit is, is um, the one, one loaf of bread is essentially the, the functional unit for, um, for that analysis. Um, then you have uh, the outputs, right? So what are the actual impacts? Um, so this could be um, resource uh, depletion, um, other outputs to nature such as uh, greenhouse gas emissions or uh, air pollution um, and, and so these are all the things that you have to when, when you're building an LCA and you go and, and do the work to collect all the data for what all the inputs are and what all are, are all the outputs Um, right, and so energy, water, um, emissions to air, emissions to land, emissions to water. Um, here, um, in terms of the impacts, um, let's say we want to look at the greenhouse gas emissions for two different systems. Um, so here are... Um, uh, uh, a, a set of different greenhouse gases. So uh, carbon dioxide, methane, um, nitrous oxide, um, and SF6, I believe that's some kind of uh, fluoride um, um, molecule. So all of these, all of these different um, uh, compounds molecules are greenhouse gases so if you release these into the atmosphere they'll lead to some amount of, of global warming um, and so when we look at the impacts in our inventory analysis this might be something that we come out with right so we, we, we figure out what all of the inputs are we measure the associated impacts of all those in, uh, inputs and and add them all up and get a whole set of, of outputs. So for system one and system two, these two different types of computers, um, you were getting uh, per computer 100 kilograms of CO2 for system one, 120 kilograms of CO2 for system two, uh, and then you have some amount of methane and, and so on and so forth. Um, so now the question becomes, uh, okay, which one of these has a larger carbon footprint? Um, this is kind of similar to, um, uh, to the, the functional unit idea. Uh, it's, really, it's really hard to assess the greenhouse gas impacts, right? Because these all sort of mean different things. Um, so, so this, I, I wouldn't actually just be able to, to add them up and say which one is, is the most, right? This, this is kind of a, a, a silly joke that's, that's pretty re relevant for um, doing sort of LCA analysis. You, you find all these different metrics uh, and then sometimes people will just kind of add them up and, and it won't really mean anything, right? So, um, you know, in, in this particular example, you have units that are uh, in terms of uh, years, in terms of uh, um, feet or meters, I don't know exactly what they're measuring the altitude in, and then population number of people, and then you just add them all up, and, and that's your sort of total impact. So, so you can't actually do that. You have to put everything on uh, a level playing field, similar um, to which when we're thinking about the inputs, we want to think about everything in terms of, uh, of a functional unit. Um, so the impact assessment um, standard um, requirements uh, 
this requires selecting a particular impact category with which you can standardize everything. Um, and the indicators are, are all the different uh, metrics. So if I wanna do a particular impact category for greenhouse gas emissions, I can do that in terms of what's called a CO2 equivalent. And I'll, and I'll show that in just, just a moment. Uh, and then their indicators would be all of the different types of pollutants. So, uh, CO2 is a type of indicator, methane is a type of indicator for um, CO2 equivalents. Um, and then you will want to classify the results into a set of uh, categories. There's a standard set of categories, which I'll show in a second. Um, and then you characterize them, and that's part of the whole interpretation process um, about what the sort of impacts means. Um, and, and involves calculating impacts in the particular category that you're, you're uh, choosing. Okay, so going back to the example um, from, uh, the, from two slides ago or three slides ago, the manufacturing of the computers, um, you, can, you have disparate sorts of impacts because the emissions are different, but they can all be put into uh, a similar type of, of category. So if I were to emit uh, like one unit of methane, um, it would be uh, the equivalent of uh, 25 units of carbon dioxide um, in terms of uh, heating your climate. Um, okay, I see a question. What do you mean by assigning LCI results to categories? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover that in, in the next slide, actually. There's a whole set of, of categories to choose from that, that helps inform how you select the, the impacts. Um, okay, and so uh, going, going back to this, um, I, I can't... I cannot add up all of these things um, because they're sort of just different items. Um, but if I standardize them through this conversion metrics, which tells me, okay, for every one unit of methane, it's 25, it's equal to 25 units of carbon dioxide. For every one unit of uh, N2O, nitrous oxide, um, that's equivalent to about 300 units of, of CO2. Uh, we know this through sort of atmospheric chemistry and climate modeling. Um, we, we can see basically how much heating that each of these different compounds will lead to. Um, and so then uh, you have a different unit uh, known as CO2E, which is uh, the uh, carbon dioxide equivalent. And if I multiply everything through, I can now uh, have everything in terms of one, uh, one impact unit, um, and I, I can add them up. And here, in this case, I would be able to do a direct comparison and say, okay, um, computer B is better because it has lower, um, lower impact once I've standardized everything. Okay, um, so the classification into categories. Um, so what sorts of things are we um, categorizing our impacts as? Um, a lot of what I've basically focused on um, is climate change. Uh, and, and so that one is fairly straightforward because um, I, can, I can simply look at like global warming potentials and, and add them all up. Um, but there are a whole bunch of different uh, impacts that you could measure. Um, so resource depletion uh, for certain materials, uh, other damage categories include like human health uh, and ecosystem quality. Um, and, and so the, the damage categories um, can be measured in a variety of ways. So this could also be things like number of deaths. This could be uh, measures uh, of morbidity. So this could be something like, um, particularly in the context of energy, if you have lots of air pollution, like how many more cases of like respiratory disease uh, are, are being caused. 
uh, how many more cases of like asthma are being seen in a particular region if you do a particular type of thing, right? And so there's, there are lots of different ways of measuring impacts. And so as part of the um, goal scoping and deciding on the, uh, um, the ultimate goal and, and, um, uh, an outcome of your system, you want to be able to decide on, uh, the type of, of impacts, um, based off of, you know, these general categories. Um, so hopefully that, that clears up, um, that, that question, right? Because I, I, I could be, you know, I could be looking specifically for, uh, for something like um, the the genes example, I could be looking specifically at resource use, but I could also do a different type of analysis that would look at impacts of climate change. I could look at a different example that might even look at impacts on like human health, right? Um, and so depending on your uh, classification of category um, or decision on, on choosing which category and impacts that you're uh, looking at, that can lead your analysis to really different directions. Again, um, going more into detail on damage categories and, and impacts of, of interest, that would be something that you would um, talk a little bit more about in, in a sort of fuller discussion of this topic in like a, in, in a LCA class. For, for what we're doing a lot a lot of um, the impacts that we're going to be concerned about are, are mainly with with climate change, but sometimes with um, resource use as well. Um, the characterization uh, we went through this example um, already with the with the different computer um, different computer systems. Um, these are making scores for each category based on um, aligning all of your impacts into something uh, comparable. So greenhouse gases, um, they use the global warming potential weights to get everything in terms of CO2 equivalents. Um, so what's the sort of right category to choose? Are we looking at uh, economic impact, environmental impacts? Um, all of these, all of these um, uh, final outcomes from the analysis. Uh, this is where there's some subjectivity, right? It really depends on what you're interested in, what you're trying to do. Um, so there isn't necessarily one sort of right answer. There are certain types of standards for, uh, you know, different types of like regulations, for example, may require you to do an LCA uh, that includes both economic impacts and environmental impacts, and then you leave it up to some kind of uh, um, maybe like a, a policymaker to do the ultimate interpretation in terms of like how they want to balance trade-offs between uh, you know environment and, and human health and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, so so again, there is there is a really good uh, good amount of subjectivity and assumptions that that sort of go in into uh, a life cycle analysis and, and oftentimes that's why uh, you know for in my field for example uh, where where I do a lot of, of work on transportation and with electric vehicles uh, people who do LCA of electric vehicle systems uh, often show really sort of different answers um, across a wide spectrum spectrum of assumptions and activities and if you look in the like peer reviewed literature, you know, the, the scientific papers that, that people are, are publishing, you know, those numbers are constantly uh, changing. Uh, they're all really different. Again, because we're looking at, at a whole slew of different things, um, the system boundaries are different, the types of impacts people are interested in uh, are, are, are not the same. Um, and so it's important to, to keep in mind uh, there, there is a lot of um, sort of subjectivity when it comes to, to doing these analyses, uh, but it's important to still be robust uh, and be, be choosing sort of assumptions that are defensible and, and, and sort of make sense.
um, life cycle. Uh, it's, it's widely used um, for alternative energy technologies, which is why we're, we're, we're really sort of concerned about it in, in this class, um, because thinking about the full energy pathway is, is really important. Um, but the two examples that um, I'm really gonna highlight uh, in, in this class are, are thinking about uh, electricity generation and the life cycle associated with that, as well as uh, transportation. So these two particular examples are things we'll, we'll look at in, in a little bit more detail. So I'm not gonna get actually too much into the weeds right now with this. Um, this, let's see, this might be a, a typical, um, uh, pathway for uh, transportation and we'll actually dive a lot more into detail on this in, in later slides. So we'll continue forward. Um, the components of the LCA to think about, so as we draw out the pathway, uh, I'm, I'm getting a little bit more specific here when we're thinking about energy and, and transportation uh, based LCAs. Um, the, the components uh, that, are, that typically show up are, are things like extraction of your primary energy source. And so this is either like mining of the material, um, growing the biomass, um, uh, and, and also uh, production and, and processing. Transport of, of that fuel or feedstock to whatever uh, production facility so this might be um, for, for transportation. It might be like crude oil going to a refinery. Um, production uh, of the fuel from feedstock. So, you know, we talk, we talk pretty generically about um, uh, use of gasoline or use of like hydrogen. Um, but depending on the process that you're doing, even to do that refining, um, uh, it can it can lead to really sort of different impacts and so uh, you need a good handle on is the gasoline being produced from uh, or, or, or is it sorry is a diesel being produced from uh, crude oil or is it being produced from biodiesel or is it um, getting uh, produced artificially through like Fisher tropes um, these can uh, these can have really different sort of upstream impacts, even if the use of the diesel in, in the use phase of like the, the truck um, may be really sort of similar across, uh, across the different upstream uh, production ends. Um, and lastly, uh, typical components of an LCA, um, so production, which we talked about, uh, fuel storage and distribution can re be really important. Uh, so you might be doing things like uh, having evaporative emissions, uh, oil or gasoline spills, uh, leaks, all of these things might be things that you'd wanna take, it, um, take into account in your LCA. Um, for electricity, um, depending on the different types of generation, obviously you're gonna have really different impacts. Uh, and then even uh, emissions along every sort of stage, even at the end, end use stage, you might have something, right? So if you are doing electricity, it might not be really a, much of an impact because say you're just using like a toaster or something that, that doesn't have any emissions associated with the use, it's all sort of upstream. But if you are driving your car, right, you're actively combusting the vehicle uh, fuel uh, and, and, and that's leading to emissions. Um, so, so keep in mind this, this, the, this sort of uh, last couple slides as kind of a, a framework guide for um, common processes that are included in, in a typical energy LCA. Um, okay, before I dive into this section, let's take a quick uh, like three or four minute break. Um, I'm gonna get some water really quick, but if folks have uh, any questions, type them in uh, into chat and I'll, uh, I'll um, ad address them when I come back.
Um, okay. There's a question, do we need to read the materials that are uncovered in lecture three by ourselves? Um, I guess the, all the reading is, is sort of uh, optional um, because I can only sort of cover so much during lecture. There's, there's probably some material that <clears throat> that's gonna be um, slightly new in, in the readings. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's sort of on your own to, to read that. Um, but if, if there's anything that you sort of don't understand or wanna go more in detail, um, I'm happy to, to help with that. Um, oh, okay, I see. Um, actually, the question is about uh, in the lecture slides themselves, um, there are some materials that, that um, wasn't covered. Um, yeah, you can, you can look over that yourselves. Um, I think that anything that, that I sort of didn't get to in, in the slides, um, it's, it's sort of further details uh, of, of material that, that was covered. Um, so hopefully it should be pretty intuitive. It should mainly be um, some, some examples um, and applications of, of, of methods. But again, if there's anything sort of confusing about that, um, you, can, you can reach out to me and, and I can help uh, to, to explain. Okay, um, let's, let's continue on. Um, so the next section is, is thinking about um, practical examples uh, of LCA. Um, so life cycle analysis approach, uh, again, just uh, as a quick refresher, specifying the problem, defining your system boundaries, uh, looking at the input data, doing calculation, uh, and then oftentimes you'll want to do sensitivity because um, the assumptions that you're making can be um, particularly uh, Im important and, and a driving factor for the ultimate impact. Um, that's not something we'll cover here, but just know that, that a lot of these sort of analyses often will have some sorts of sensitivity analysis to, to tell you how robust your answer actually is. Um, so looking at some energy pathways. So these are examples that are, that will be much more sort of common in, in the energy field. So crude oil to gasoline, uh, natural gas to hydrogen. We'll actually start with the latter one first. Um, so this might be uh, something from your <coughs> uh, production of, of hydrogen. Um, a lot of hydrogen is produced, uh, um, the majority of hydrogen is produced uh, via a process called uh, steam methane reformation, uh, SMR. Um, and, and that has to do, um, that, that actually uses uh, natural gas, which is why you, you have um, at the sort of top end of your analysis, um, natural gas extraction and cleanup and transportation of that. Um, the steam methane reformation happens uh, at your central hydrogen plant uh, here. Um, and then you have a liquefaction process to turn it into uh, liquid H2O, or um, not H2O, uh, H2. Uh, and then that can get uh, transported um, to your final destination. Um, via, uh, in, in this particular example, you're using uh, trucks. Um, this, this example also has uh, um, a little side process here uh, where it sequesters the, the CO2, but um, don't worry about that. We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna ignore that um, for this particular example. Then you go to your refueling station into the final operation of the vehicle. And so when I think about the impact of uh, hydrogen use in, uh, in my end stage for a vehicle, for example. You know, oftentimes people will call these, um, this technology zero emissions, um, which is kind of true um, at the tailpipe, although it, it does actually emit water as a byproduct. So not, even then, not, not technically true, but for, for the most part, right, it's, it's, it's very, 
clean at the tailpipe, but as I include well to wheels analysis, that is to say a life cycle analysis of hydrogen, you have lots of sources of impacts upstream um, so that we know in reality, it's not actually uh, zero emissions. So this is the generic energy pathway for uh, transportation. Um, we have in the hydrogen example, um, vehicle operation, combustion and evaporation, not much uh, of an um, impact here, right? Because there, there isn't much coming out of the tailpipe besides water. Um, but in the, the fuel production and, and um, transport and storage of, of the fuel, and all of um, the associated processes, you're gonna have uh, some impacts. And you can think about how different this would, um, uh, th this generic pathway might look for a different type of fuel. So if we're talking about gasoline, uh, then you would have some emissions impact out of here now um, because uh, combustion of, of, of gas leads to CO2, uh, uh, carbon monoxide, maybe a, the, maybe some uh, nitrous oxides, um, and then the production of gasoline uh, would be really different. Um, okay, so for, for hydrogen, it's SMR. Uh, for gasoline, this would be uh, refining from crude oil. Okay, and so, um, even though we have these sort of generic energy pathways, um, the specificity of what goes into these inputs um, is going to depend uh, pretty heavily on um, the transportation system that you're particularly interested in. Uh, again, uh, you'll want to define your boundaries, right? So in this particular case, it doesn't include primary energy input, but it does include secondary energy input. Um, uh, and then this, all of this is based off of assumptions and how you think, uh, how, what you think the most important impacts are to include in here. Um, it's very conceivable that you would, in some examples, uh, extend your system boundary to include your primary energy input as well. Um, yeah, okay, uh, question, what does SMR mean? Um, so in the, in the previous example, what I was talking about is the production of hydrogen. So hydrogen is um, steam, methane, uh, reformation. Um, and that's SMR. Um, that, is, that is a specific chemical process that is used to create hydrogen. And the majority of hydrogen that we produce today uh, comes through this chemical process, not actually through something like electrolysis, which is actually a lot more expensive and energy intensive uh, now, today, to, to make hydrogen uh, than, um, than doing steam methane reformation, um, which has a lot more carbon emissions associated with it, um, but it's cheap, cheaper to do. Um, and, and actually, I, if I, even, I might even take a step back here and say, um, in, in here where I, I drew this thing out in the last slide and I said H2 from SMR, that's actually only one sort of pathway. You could also have hydrogen coming from electrolysis. Um, and the impacts associated with doing SMR or electrolysis are also gonna be really different. And so you'll, uh, as you, uh, design the system, you need to make some decision about what you uh, assume or think um, the, the actual process is um, that's, that's, you know, producing the fuel. Um, there's also, uh, in, in addition to this component, which we were just looking at, there's, um, so use phase, there's also this component, which is um, the production. So we gave an example of this before, 
right? With the, with the oven, um, what's, there's the energy associated with like making the marginal amount of bread, but there's also the energy and resources associated with building the oven. Same here. Um, this, is, this is all of the energy and emissions and impacts and process associated with um, the marginal sort of use of the vehicle uh, and all of this stuff here is um, uh, production of the vehicle, uh, as well as it, it includes end of life here um, on the bottom. So this would be uh, disposing, recycling of the vehicle once, once you're um, done with it. Okay, so you've got the fuel cycle and, and the vehicle cycle. Um, so what inputs are needed to do a life cycle analysis of the emissions? So you need, so this is really getting down into the nitty gritty of the like inventory. You need fuel and materials inputs and outputs of the system, characteristics of technologies used, um, physical and chemical properties of the fuels, energy conversion, efficiency, and emissions. Um, this is just a little bit of reference material. Um, character, the, this is uh, the characteristics of fuels and primary energy sources. Uh, so you can use this as a reference point um, uh, within uh, future work that you're doing. You can always uh, cite this. Um, and, and so this tells you um, a, a variety of different characteristics, heating value, uh, density, uh, amount of carbon, uh, amount of sulfur, um, and, and this helps you get at some of the impacts. Um, in terms of the um, impacts, you can actually look at, uh, as, as I mentioned before, we're mainly going to be concerned with um, greenhouse gas emissions and local air pollutants. Um, and so the emission factors are uh, the amount of pollution output per unit of energy input um, or per unit of something. Um, for transportation, it could also be like per unit of like distance traveled. So like CO2 per, mi per mile uh, or, or per kilometer. Um, that is an example of an emissions factor. Um, generally for uh, energy-based emission factors, they use the higher heating value. But that's, that's just sort of a convention. Um, and you can do a unit conversion calculator um, to, to, to get at some of these um, units. And then, so a different slide of reference materials of emission factors for different uh, combustions. Um, so if you are, um, for every MMBTU of, of uh, particular fuel, so this would be uh, natural gas, diesel, or gasoline, going through a different sort of um, uh, <clears throat> production use. So bo uh, uh, industrial boiler or a small boiler or a gas turbine, um, these will have slightly different uh, emission factors because the efficiencies of, of these different um, production units can, can, can be um, slightly different. Um, okay, so I think, I think that uh, you guys are sort of uh, drinking from a, a fire hose here. This is a lot of material for, um, to, to sort of learn in, in one lecture, uh, thinking about uh, details associated with um, life cycle analysis. And so I, I, I do want to sort of take a step back and, and just sort of make sure that, that the big takeaway from, from what we're talking about today is to acknowledge um, that there are important upstream impacts and that when I look at any sort of energy system and, I, and I'm sort of just looking at, you know, uh, the impacts associated with driving a car, it's, it's not just the burning of the gasoline, right? It's like the production of the vehicle, it's the um, extraction and processing of the fuel, and all of these can lead to um, additional impacts that you might not consider otherwise. And so that's mainly the concept that I wanna put into your mind. All of this stuff that we're talking about now, 
with um, conventional examples um, and, and sort of how to do that. You know, you can figure how you can figure out how to do that. Um, uh, there are examples to do it uh, in here. There's lots of like reference materials. Um, but if you have in your mind uh, sort of uh, in, in your mindset that when you approach um, analyses that you need to think about some of these upstream impacts, um, I think that's that's the most important step is, is not to ignore some of these things. Um, and so all, all of the material in, in the slides and lecture will be sort of nice reference for, your, for you to like go back uh, and, and see how to actually do it when, once it gets to, to, that, to that step. So uh, don't, um, don't be too uh, flustered with the um, uh, amount of uh, detail in, in how you actually conduct the LCA. Just um, make sure that you understand the concept of it and, and that uh, it's something that you consider in, in, in your work in, in the future. Um, okay, and so we're going to move on and we're going to talk about uh, actually doing some pretty basic LCAs um, that's going to tie, tie in some of the dimensional uh, analysis um, that, that we've been doing before. Um, so, so some of these questions may look pretty familiar and, and some of the calculations are, are actually going to hopefully uh, be sort of refreshers for everyone. Um, here, uh, we want to look at uh, some example calculations of looking at impacts of electricity use associated with um, uh, electricity produced from coal. So, okay, how much electricity do you produce from uh, five tons of coal? So hopefully you guys can uh, have in your heads um, uh, uh, clearly how to, how to go about doing this. Um, so if I have five tons of coal, we can do a conversion, um, how much electricity is, pro uh, is produced based off of the um, energy content of, of coal. So that would be 22.66 gigajoules written down there for you per one ton. Um, we multiply this by uh, the conversion factor to go to the same units of electricity from gigajoules, uh, and then we would multiply by the efficiency, which uh, tells you how much electricity uh, you can convert based off of the uh, energy content of the coal. So this would be times 32%. Um, actually, just to be, oops. I didn't mean to do that. Just to be extra clear, um, you can do it like this, 32 kilowatt hours of electricity per 100 kilowatt hours of um, coal. So this is something like this, gigajoules of coal. Um, okay, and so this would be equivalent to, uh, it's about 10 megawatt hours. Um, so this is roughly about two kilowatt hours per kilogram of coal. Um, so you can, you can sort of keep this number in mind. Actually, I'll, I'll write that up here, two kilowatt hours per kilogram. That is the um, energy of, um, uh, that's the amount of electricity we produce per amount of coal. You erase all this stuff. Um, okay, how much CO2 is emitted from burning five tons of coal? Okay, if we know that coal is about 60% carbon by weight uh, and it's complete combustion, um, this is uh, pretty straightforward to calculate as well. So this one is, is a bit of a new calculation. 
um, so five tons of coal. Uh, so then you have 0.6 um, amount of uh, by mass uh, carbon per one unit of mass of coal, right? That's this, that's this thing here, 60% carbon by weight. Uh, and then if we want to translate into CO2, um, there are 44 um, grams per mole. So this is the molecular weight of CO2. Um, so as a quick refresher, carbon has a molecular weight of uh, 12 and oxygen is 16, so it's 12 plus 16 times two for CO2, which is uh, 44 um, per 12 grams per mole of carbon. Um, and so these will cancel out. Uh, this will cancel out. So then this, uh, so this will be in terms of tons of CO2. So this would be 11 tons of CO2. Um, and this is roughly 2.2 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of coal. Okay, so I'm gonna write that up here as well. So this would be 2.2 kilograms CO2 per kilogram of coal. Oops. Let me erase all this stuff. Okay. So what is the emissions factor of the coal? Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, uh, all you have to do is uh, divide. So our final answer was 11 tons of CO2 per five tons divided by uh, 10 uh, megawatt hours. Um, you could also divide, uh, it's the same thing as doing 2.2 um, kilograms of CO2 divided by two kilowatt hours. Um, so this is about 1.1 uh, kilograms of CO2 uh, per kilowatt hour. So we'll, we'll write that here too, 11 kilograms CO2 per kilowatt hour. Um, okay, and so for every, um, for every one kilowatt hour um, of electricity I produce from coal, I emit about 11 kilograms of CO2. Okay. Um, what about uh, emissions upstream? Um, so you actually have uh, emissions that are associated with mining uh, and transportation of the coal. And so here I'm, I'm sort of just able to provide these numbers for you. So here it would be uh, 20 grams of CO2 uh, emitted extra per kilogram of coal coming from the mining and transportation, as well as four grams of methane um, per kilogram of, of coal, right? And so we know before that CH4 is a greenhouse gas. Uh, it's about 28 times the effect of CO2. Um, uh, I should mention that I did notice um, in some of the slides before when we were talking about the CO2 equivalent thing, uh, CH4 was listed as 25 times. Um, so that's an older number. Um, this is something that the uh, IPCC uh, investigates and releases in the report. So the most recent one is between 28 to 32 times the effect of CO2. Uh, that's why that number differs here. <clears throat> 
Um, so four grams of CH4 is equivalent to 112 uh, gram CO2 equivalent. Um, and so now what we want to do is to modify um, the answer, our final emissions rate up here, the, this 11 kilograms of CO2 um, per kilowatt hour. Um, okay, and so let's quickly do that modification and sort of see how uh, that, that changes our answer. Um, so we know that there's 2.2 kilograms of CO2. So this is from combustion. And now I'm going to add um, this extra uh, emissions uh, from mining and transport. So 0.132 kilograms of CO2 uh, equivalent. Um, so this is from upstream. Uh, and I divide this um, by, this is per kilogram of coal. And I know that each kilogram of coal Uh, produces two kilowatt hours of electricity, right? We know that from uh, from up here. We calculated before. And this final number will equal to, um, it'll be about, uh, 1.16 uh, kilograms of CO2 per uh, kilowatt hour, um, which we'll sort of round off to. Well, actually, this is fine. We'll, we'll leave it at 1.6. Um, or 1.16. OK. So now we can see that. Um, if I, if I were to um, include the upstream portion um, of electricity production from coal, then your final impact is slightly higher, right? You've got this extra um, 0.06 kilograms of CO2 per kilowatt hour, and, and that can really sort of add up over large quantities of, of electricity. Great. So let's take uh, a sort of final example um, uh, application of this. Um, the average electricity use in a home in the US is about 24 kilowatt hours uh, equivalent per day. Um, so that's, it's basically at one kilowatt uh, for the entire day. Um, so to give uh, some sense of, of what that, that energy amount is um, as, a, as a quick sort of refresher. So like one kilowatt hour is like equivalent to running your fridge for about two hours. It's uh, the same as, you know, a 60 watt light bulb for 16 hours uh, and the running your air conditioner for about 30 minutes. Um, so what, So we're interested in looking at the greenhouse gas emissions of CO2 equivalent from a residential user of electricity from a coal plant. So in addition to the number that we already calculated, there's also um, some losses in transmission. So 10% losses um, from transmitting across the transmission and distribution power lines from the power plant to your home. So we assume it's about 90% efficient. Um, in reality, it's, 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 it's a bit higher than that. Um, you're probably closer to about 98%, but for this example, just makes the numbers a little bit easier. Um, so, so in our calculation, we'll need to keep that in mind. So now let's think about, so what are the emissions from the average house powered by coal over the course of a year? So let's uh, once again, um, do some dimensional analysis, uh, keeping in mind that we are, we're, we're um, tying in um, some of the, the lessons learned 
uh, from this lecture, uh, the upstream emissions for, from the transportation and mining of, of the coal, which is now sort of being included in, in this analysis. Um, so we'll start with our 20, 24 kilowatt hours. Um, I'm gonna call this of home electricity uh, per day. Uh, and now I have to multiply by, um, so 10 kilowatt hours per nine kilowatt hours. Um, so this is the efficiency piece of it. So for every nine kilowatt hours I get at home, I have to produce 10 kilowatt hours um, in the plant. Um, let's see. Uh, I see a question. Can you post the answer for the example for those who want to review? Yeah, so actually in the slides I have um, hidden slides. Um, actually, I'm not sure if those get printed out in the PDF. I'll, I'll have to check. Um, but if not, I'll, I'll repost them. There are, there are extra slides that will have, um, that will have the, the answers. Oh, sorry. So question, what does it say next to um, 24 kilowatt hours? Um, here, let me, let me write it bigger. Um, uh, it's 24 kilowatt hours uh, of, of, of uh, home. So, so the whole idea is like there's electricity coming uh, at home and there's electricity coming out of the plant. And the reason why it's different is because there's some efficiency here. Um, uh, losses, so for every nine kilowatt hours at home, you have to produce 10 kilowatt hours at the plant um, because you lose 10%. Um, so that's this part of the dimensional analysis. Um, okay, and then the last thing that I need to do is include the um, emissions rate, which we calculated before as 1.16 um, ki kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour coming out of the plant. Okay, uh, once again, um, we're able to do our cancellation and our um, uh, analysis to make sure that we've, we've done this correctly. Good. Um, yeah, and so uh, I see a comment and the unit of time uh, exactly, so I'll, I'll, I'll do that at the end. Um, well, I'll, I'll kind of just write it out. Uh, so this is 30.9 kilograms of CO2 equivalent per day. Uh, and if you multiply by 365 and convert it to, to tons, I'm not, I'm not gonna write it all out. Um, you get about 11 tons uh, of CO2 per year. Let me, um, oops ran out of room, so I'm gonna write it up, up top. So this, this is about the same as uh, 11 tons uh, CO2 per year. Okay, and so all you have to do is multiply by 365 uh, and then convert the kilograms to tons um, of CO2 equivalents. Okay. So that, um, so that is our, our way of, of uh, even including, including a whole bunch of sort of different aspects of the life cycle analysis. Uh, you know, even though this, this sort of brushes aside a lot of the uh, material that, that I covered in the, um, in the previous portion of the lecture because you know the impacts are already sort of chosen for us. We just—it's saying we we specifically are interested in GHG emissions, so that simplifies it. And then a lot of the inventory analysis is is done for us because it it already sort of tells us um, things like uh, you know what are the actual efficiency uh, losses, and um, also you know what are the actual um, uh, emissions impacts. And so in what, if you're starting the LCA from scratch, 
like defining the boundary and figuring out these numbers and, and calculating what the inventories are for, you know, extra CO2 emissions for the mining and CH4 emissions for the mining and transportation. That's a lot of the groundwork that goes into, into the LCA. Um, but again, the, the concept here is like, is basically the fact that we need to include all of that, that stuff. And so before we were mainly just looking at emissions rate per sort of burning some amount of coal um, or producing some amount of electricity. But now we're, we're thinking about, okay, specifically at what point are we thinking about the electricity? So in this case, it's the residential user. And then we also are thinking about all these upstream impacts. So again, getting comfortable and ingrained and getting uh, upstream stuff ingrained in your thinking will be um, the most important sort of takeaway here. Um, you can also do um, let's see uh, uh, impacts from if I wanted to do this from a natural gas electric generator instead. So here I'm just gonna quickly uh, go through this example. It's it's tying again together the dimensional analysis um, uh, as well as um, uh, thinking about this this life cycle stuff. So real quickly, so 24 kilowatt hours at home. Again, our starting point per day. Uh, we need to go through that efficiency thing again. So uh, for the trans uh, transmission of electricity, so uh, 10 kilowatt hours from the plant is nine kilowatt hours um, at home. Uh, we know that the efficiency is 45%. So for every 100 kilowatt hours uh, of uh, gas content, uh, I produce 45 kilowatt hours out of the power plant. Um, we need to convert this into gigajoules to get it in equivalence for the heat rate, uh, or not, uh, not the heat rate, sorry, the uh, heating value, two different things. So this would be the, uh, conversion factor, which is a constant. Okay, um, and then we're gonna multiply that against um, the heating value. So one ton of CH4 um, per 53.08, um, or sorry, 06 um, gigajoules. Uh, and then finally, so um, if I if I go through all these steps, this will tell me the tons of CH, the tons of methane emitted uh, to provide one day of electricity at home. Um, but I want to get the emissions, and so the emissions are um, for a complete combustion. Uh, process of methane, you get uh, one molecule of CO2 per molecule of CH4. So it's the same conversion here, except um, you're doing it with uh, CH4 directly. Um, so the molecular weight of methane is 16. Okay, and so let's make sure all of this works. So kilowatt hours home cancels out, kilowatt hours plant cancels out, kilowatt hours gas cancels, um, and then gigajoules cancels out, and then tons of CH4 uh, cancels out with the CH4, uh, and then the grams of moles cancel out uh, per mole, and so then you end up getting left with approximately uh, 0.011 uh, tons of CO2 per day. And I can translate this to about four tons CO2 per year. Okay. Um, and so this, uh, this compares, um, with coal, right, uh, in, in the previous example. So this is natural gas, and coal was about 11 tons. 
uh, of CO2 per year. So this is coal. Um, so that's roughly what we would actually expect. Um, natural gas is significantly cleaner than, than, than coal. And I've left um, another table as a reference material for you. This gives uh, the CO2 emissions um, from the average electricity generation mix. Um, so you get about a uh, thousand kilograms per megawatt hour or a thousand grams per kilowatt hour for coal and a little bit less than half that for, for natural gas. Um, Okay, uh, I see a question. Can I go back to the calculations for a second? Yes, let me see if I can pull it back up. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay, so is there a specific question here? Um, okay, no question. We're all good. Yeah, sorry if it's moving a little fast. I want to finish up the, the, the lecture today. Um, I'm actually going to skip forward a couple slides. I think that um, you guys should be able to work through um, this example yourselves. And actually, I, I feel like we've already sort of spent uh, some time looking at um, particular examples of this. Um, these are filling out the sort of um, generic pathway with specific pathways for uh, uh, fuel cycles like crude oil. But I've, I've already sort of talked about what would sort of go in here. These are um, maybe a little more specific details about the inputs and, and outputs. Um, and then this, this just includes um, uh, this slide just includes um, the the use phase emissions um, and associated attributes of the vehicle that you would want to know to to figure these things uh, figure out these these emissions. Uh, and this uh, last example slide is um, thinking about uh, a slightly different fuel pathway um, and what it would look like for uh, a hydrogen fuel technology. Uh, and and I guess the, the main point here is that um, you can see that there is like a fairly, uh, even though we're using the same generic pathway for different fuels, uh, as I discussed before, um, these, what goes into that pathway and, and those details are gonna be really different. In, in this diagram, one of the um, sort of, uh, unique things uh, as is, as I mentioned before, is that uh, for hydrogen vehicles, there's no emissions happening um, coming out of your end use. It's all upstream, right? Um, which differs from your gas vehicle where you do have emissions in the use phase because it's combusting gasoline as you drive. Okay, so that, covers um, the main sort of examples and, and thoughts that, that we wanna think about with uh, life cycle analysis. Um, I did wanna introduce one sort of last uh, concept. Um, everything that we've been talking about is thinking about attributional, uh, what's called attributional life cycle assessment. There's a different type of LCA um, called consequential. Um, uh, and, and this is kind of a, a little bit newer. It's been around still for, for a while now, um, uh, a couple of decades, but it's, it's a pretty different way of thinking about um, uh, how to do life cycle assess assessment. And so it thinks about how if I do a particular, if I create a particular product or process, it, it changes a lot of other th uh, things that could have happened in in um, in a larger sort of system model and, and so it thinks about the causal relationships between these um, and so let me talk a little bit more concretely um, so in a consequential lca you may have a demand for a product and you think about the production of that one thing um, and so you can chase the whole trace the whole supply chain back and do all the measuring 
of all the um, sub products and, and the processes associated in that system. In consequential LCA, it's pretty different. So demand for one product comes from a whole interconnected set of, of processes. And so how are other products affected uh, because I produce that one thing? Um, and so this is pretty similar to what we refer to as an economic equilibrium analysis. And so let me just quickly go through uh, the next uh, set of slides to maybe uh, at least give you a more solid grasp of, of what we're talking about in, in attributional versus um, consequential. Um, so here, let's suppose um, I, uh, I am producing uh, electricity from these different sources, okay. Um, so the way that I would try and figure out the impact of any sort of product that's, that's, that's coming out of using electricity from all of these things um, is, is done by, uh, oops, is, is done by uh, adding up the total emissions coming out of all of this. So um, you've got uh, a thousand kilograms from coal um, uh, per megawatt hour and you multiply that by the amount of electricity being produced. Uh, and then from, let's see, my natural gas plant, I have 500 kilograms of CO2 per megawatt hour and I multiply by 500 and I can get the total amount of CO2. And so this is like system-wide across all this electricity um, for 4,500 megawatt hours of electricity that I'm producing across all of these power plants, I have an average emissions rate of 437.5 kilograms of CO2 per megawatt hour. Okay, great. And so this, this is what we would call as attributional and you would use this number basically in your life cycle assessment for electricity production associated with whatever that you're interested in measuring. Okay, consequential is, is slightly different. Um, so what, it's, what it does is it thinks about, okay, uh, maybe I have a base, base load of, of energy demand. So this means um, uh, I have my fridge on, I have my lights on and, and so on and so forth. Um, and so I have different power plants supplying the electricity to those things. Um, and let's say in order to provide all of that power, my nuclear power plant and my coal power plant and my wind and my solar are at full capacity. And then that means that the natural gas plant, say that's what we call uh, the marginal generator, right? Okay, say, say it's on like 95%, 95, 95%, but it still, it still has some buffer room to turn on a little bit more electricity. So then, Let's say the next thing that you plug in, uh, let's say you're, you're deciding to charge an electric vehicle. Instead of using the average value as you would in the attributional case, you are saying that the emissions associated with charging the electric vehicle is coming from the natural gas. And so it will, it will be different from the emissions rate uh, on average that you would use in an attributional um, method. So therefore EV charging happens at a rate of 500 kilograms per megawatt hour as, a, as opposed to um, in the previous slide, oops, in this slide it's at 437. And so it's actually dirtier than, than if you would do it with an attributional uh, emissions way. In the sort of like scientific community um, there's actually, it, it's not necessarily strictly correct to do attributional versus consequential. There is no sort of right way to do it and there's like an ongoing debate that's been going on for the last like 10 years uh, about people who think consequential uh, approach is correct versus attributional. Um, so oftentimes you'll, you'll sort of report both. Um, this is not something that we're really gonna um, used that much in, in, in this course, but you know, it's a, it's a concept that I think is, is fairly interesting and, and an important distinction when we're, when we're thinking about doing LCA, that there's this sort of different approach um, to, to how, how you would actually do it. Um, okay, 
um, we are talking about an energy policy class. And at the beginning, I, I sort of highlighted uh, why it's important to think about life cycle analysis. And, and hopefully now that we've gone through the slides, you, you guys can, can yourselves identify the importance of, of um, doing LCA. Uh, and, and it has been incorporated in a lot of policies around um, the world and in the US. Actually, California in, um, in particular is really sort of um, uh, one of the frontiers uh, on including LC analysis in, in thinking about you know, like climate change solutions and, and regulations and, and legislation. Um, so I wanted to give some examples of these uh, in the real world uh, where we actually use LCA to sort of really great effect. Um, so, so a lot of you guys are, are not going to be familiar with these policies. So there's the low carbon fuel standards, and I'm also going to talk about the fuel, uh, uh, U.S. fuel efficiency standards in, in the next slide. So don't worry too much about the details. We're actually going to cover in a, in a lot more um, depth um, these energy policies in, in the sort of uh, last couple lectures in, in class um, in this course. Um, but but here. Uh, I'll, I'll just sort of briefly say uh, that there are these standards in California where they're trying to uh, get people to use um, or producers to make lower carbon fuels. Um, and one of those fuels is, is biomass um, and, and biofuels. Uh, and so you can think of like ethanol that goes into, into your, uh, in, in, that's blended with gasoline that goes into your car. And, and that's coming from crops that are raised. Um, and so you can you can measure the um, you can measure the emissions associated with like burning ethanol that's blended with gasoline in your car, and that would give you some carbon intensity. Um, and you could include that in your rec, but in, in your regulation. But in in this case, they actually went sort of above and beyond. They also wanted to look at all of the land use change. And this was actually really controversial when it, when it was first passed. And actually a lot of the analysis done for this regulation was done, done by um, folks at UC Davis. Um, and, and so the indirect land use change emissions has to do with like, okay, if, if, if we have this regulation, it's gonna incentivize producers to make biofuels uh, from corn um, and, and they, would, they would produce the fuels uh, instead of using it as feedstock to, you know, feed uh, uh, um, a lot of the corn is being used to feed uh, cows that, that, that we eat. And so it's directly displacing food. Uh, and as a result, you still need the food. And so what ends up happening is they did all this analysis to figure out, well, actually, if we, if we do that, the farmers in the U.S. are going to produce corn for uh, producing biofuels, which means uh, someone else is going to produce the corn to feed, uh, to, to, to replace the feedstock that we're losing. And that's going to lead uh, to essentially, they, they figured out that that would be happening in Brazil and that would lead to deforestation. And so if you promote biofuels in the LCFS, in the low carbon fuel standards, it leads to deforestation in the Amazon. And so there's this whole sort of like complicated upstream modeling that you have to do um, that, that is really important and relevant to, to policy. Because if we just said, okay, well, ethanol is cleaner um, when you burn it compared to, to gasoline because you, you're getting it from biofuels, well, you miss a lot of these land use impacts. And, and that actually had a really big effect on, on the credits that, that you could claim from biofuels. It was reduced a lot because it had such serious implications on 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 land use so that's that's one really um, big example of 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 life cycle analysis um, another one is in the fuel efficiency standards um, so there's regulations on uh, how fuel efficient vehicles are and that's based off of uh, you know a whole bunch of analysis uh, and and uh, cost benefit analysis so Basically, it's saying new cars have to meet a certain fuel uh, efficiency requirement. So you have to go like 55 miles per gallon, and we can actually translate that directly to emissions rates, and, and there's a standard for that too. But what happens as we start to uh, transition into like hydrogen vehicles or electric vehicles, there's no emissions associated at the tailpipe, right? Um, 
And, and so it depends on the emission source. And so to do this properly, you need to be able to account for upstream emissions coming from, or from power plants. And so there are some details about that being discussed in future policies and they have some kind of like placeholders for that in the in existing policy. But this is another sort of important demonstration where life cycle impacts and analysis plays a really key role in the formation of, of energy policy. Um, yeah, okay. Um, sorry, I sort of blurred through um, the, these last couple slides uh, really quickly. Um, but hopefully this gives you um, some sense of, of the importance of, of doing LCAs in even practical energy um, policy examples. Um, we're a bit over time, um, but I'll hang around for any questions that, that folks have. Uh, otherwise, um, I will see you guys uh, um, next Monday. Uh, for the lecture and if anyone uh, wants to, there's gonna be uh, office hours uh, just before the lecture from 10 to 11. So thanks everyone, oh, have a good uh, rest of the week. Um, I see a question um, in the attributional and consequential emissions slides. Did you say that attributional was worse even though the average emissions rate was lower? Uh, no, I, I must have misspoke. I meant the consequential emission rate in, in that particular example is worse than the attributional. Um, because the attributional emissions rate was lower, it's like the 400 something as opposed to the 500. Uh, in, in that case, the attributional emissions um, are uh, um, are better or, or lower um, than the consequential. Um, but it, 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 it's not always like that. It, it'll be pretty sort of case specific. Um, yeah, and, and I should also mention that it's, it's, it, you, if you do attributional versus consequential, your results are basically always gonna be different. Um, and that one approach isn't always better than the other. Um, how do you hold your office hours via Zoom? Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, so the office hours, uh, I think I said at the beginning of class, um, but if, if you didn't catch it, uh, it'll be on Zoom and the details of the office hours um, are posted in Canvas. Um, so there's, uh, let's see, um, the, the, the Zoom link, it's posted in an announcement and it's also updated in the syllabus. Okay, um, I don't see any questions, so we will end formally for today. Thanks everyone. <laughs>